It's been a while since I've had the chance to get my hands dirty working on 124s, so I decided to do a bit of shopping this morning. It was time to buy a new battery. It was either going to go into red or into blue-black. This is the size battery that's in blue-black, but I'll tell you now, you can actually put the LH. The difference between the vanilla DIN 65L and the DIN 65LH is the height of the battery, and the 124 is more than capable of fitting the LH version here, and for a few dollars more you get higher capacity. For about five bucks more you get about a hundred cold cranking amps more, and it fits perfectly in the 124. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this was the original battery size anyway, because it just fits like a glove, and the terminals are a perfect fit as well. And yes, astonishingly, that is made in Australia. That made my day. Well, to be truthful, I specifically looked for one that wasn't made in China. Let's see what blue-black starts like now with a new battery. I wish it started as well as the red car, but it is an original engine. I have rebuilt both fuel injection systems exactly the same way, so I have no idea why this car is more difficult to start than red. I think it might just be down on compression when it's cold. In which case, I'll just rebuild the engine. I don't care. At least, if I can still get pistons anyway. But at least the starter now turns a lot more rapidly uh, than it did before. That battery was nine years old, so well overdue for replacement. But at least it will get some more use before it goes in the trash um, in red. Out of interest, let's have a look at what kind of life there is left in this battery with my Chinese battery tester. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is actually tell it the original capacity of the battery. In this case it was originally 580, and now it's a shocking 277. And it is truthfully saying, suggest replace. Before I go ahead and fit that old battery to red for the purposes of testing, I want to do some air conditioning work. And the first thing I'm going to change is the thermal expansion valve, or TX valve, that sits behind the battery on these right-hand drive cars. So it needs to get out the way. I have most air conditioning parts. I already have the new condenser installed. Um, and there's all of the parts that I'm going to be fitting today. Removal of the thermal expansion valve is pretty easy. There's just a 10 millimeter nut um, on the outside surface. That just needs to be removed. Access might be slightly more difficult on left-hand drive cars. I'm not sure. To allow the uh, large diameter line to move a bit more, uh, you just disconnect this holding clamp at the uh, second firewall, or first firewall, whichever way you count it. You just have to loosen it, and that allows that pipe to move back. The clamp is permanently retained on the large suction line, and once that's moved out of the way, it is easy to remove those two lines. They do contain O-rings, all of the hoses contain O-rings and need to be replaced when they're disturbed. These are all original by the looks of things. Uh, they're not made like that anymore. And these are all rock hard, so I'm doing the right thing by replacing them. There's also two more. Uh, screws holding in the thermal expansion valve to the actual evaporator core um, and they're two allen head screws. Here's a closer look at those two screws 
you want to be very careful with those. If you strip those heads out, you're in big trouble. There's not a lot of uh, room to work with down there. But fortunately, they're not exposed to the atmosphere, so they shouldn't really uh, get corroded in place. Um, these were pretty easy to remove, even with this uh, cheapest chips. Allen key. I had a similar experience on my blue-black car as well. It wasn't difficult to remove. Now that those screws are removed, the whole thing can simply be removed. And there are two O-rings on the um, evaporator core as well that need to be renewed. Uh, one of them retained in the TX valve, as you can see there. I think this is original. I don't see any markings on it, but the kind of price tag sticker that it has up the top uh, reminds me of what MB ones look like. Of course, surgical cleanliness is required. Everything was cleaned before the new O-rings were installed, and I do lubricate them with uh, compressor oil as well. So we're starting to make some progress now. The new TX valve is installed with its new O-rings, which you cannot see. And the hard lines are now installed on the other side with new O-rings as well. So next we move on to the next connection, the suction line. That's just another uh, O-ring replacement. And then reconnection. Of course I replace uh, both of the Schrader valves. The same tool that removes uh, bicycle and car tire Schrader valves works on these old R12 systems as well. In fact, the uh, Schrader cores themselves, although the seal material is not the same, they will fit in each other. And of course, a new cap goes on there as well. Next, it was time to move on to the receiver dryer. That must be replaced when you're fitting a new compressor, otherwise you're putting your new compressor at great mm -hmm. risk. There is some botched wiring here that I will attend to later. The receiver dryer is pretty straightforward to remove. It's two bolts uh, either side. And obviously the hose connections need to be disconnected as well. I don't ever reuse the two switches on these receiver dryers. I just put new ones on there. One of them is a high pressure switch that turns on the uh, auxiliary cooling fans at half speed. Uh, that's the red one, and the uh, flat disc shaped one with the botched wiring you can see on the top there is the one that cuts out the compressor when there's no gas in the system. So that's the area with the receiver dryer removed. Uh, it's a bit tricky to get under the bracket for the uh, ABS pump, but you get it out anyway. The new one, uh, Bear, disappointingly made in China. Not happy to see that ever on anything that I fit on my 124s, but it's just a sign of the time, unfortunately. So that's going in now. I'd probably suggest putting the switches on first before you fit the receiver dryer, uh, because they are a bit of a pain to get in. Uh, once it's in that position. So that's both lines connected as well with new O-rings and the other one unfortunately requires removal of the headlight uh, but I knew that was on the cards one day because um, I left the headlight half insecured anyway. So that's that line there that needs to get connected underneath the headlight area. 
and that's the condenser on the left. I was most curious to know if this condenser still had its uh, nitrogen charge from the factory. Um, it would indicate a leak if it didn't, so I got kind of concerned when nothing was coming out, and then wait for it. And it's just another case of a new O-ring and screwing it back together. And of course, the O-ring is lubricated. So that's starting to look quite good now. It's now time to uh, consider doing this large discharge line from the compressor itself to the condenser. And we're starting to look good. So that's now connected. Note my home mounting technique there because they forgot to install the bracket on this bare condenser at the factory. I had to make up my own solution, but it works. And of course there's a new Schrader valve in that as well. It's time to uh, get on to replacing this compressor and having to deal with these terrible belt tensioners. I really don't like this design. Uh, the later spring-loaded one is much better, but it's what I've got to deal with. So removing the belt is required, and then it's a case of uh, removing the compressor. There's four bolts on that, and there's one bolt at the rear where the manifold uh, connects to the compressor. This may be difficult to access on some cars, but on this one, it's a piece of cake you have full access to that bolt from underneath. And there are special O-rings that go in there as well, which are in my kit. So I place those on the compressor before lifting it up there and uh, just made sure that they didn't fall off in the process of getting it up there. And of course that is all cleaned. Now the compressor is mounted, all four bolts are installed, the manifold is tightened up, I can connect my uh, compressor harness. This is what the manifold looks like at the rear. As you can see on this car there's plenty of room to access that. And that's the model of compressor if you are interested. It is not a aftermarket one, it's actually the OE. Um, it's a perfect fit. I have these caps on here just to stop crap getting in the system while it's open. And that's the last hose connection done. With a new O-ring of course. It's then time to pull a vacuum and check for leaks. Doing this one-handed is not recommended, but that's what I do. So I let that run for more than an hour, uh, basically until um, I was at a maximum level of vacuum. Uh, once it wasn't going down anymore, I shut the valve and turned off the vacuum pump. It took about an hour and 15 minutes. After that, I just monitored it for a while to make sure the vacuum wasn't being lost. I was confident that I had no leaks and uh, it was time to move on to charging up the system. So this is the point where I decided to turn off the vacuum pump. It was not getting any lower than this. I'm not sure how accurate this gauge is. It's not exactly professional equipment, but it's done the job. I use the same uh, setup to do blue-black. Um, that air conditioner has worked perfectly for six years now on the original charge that I put in it, so I think I know what I'm doing now. Surprisingly, this Chinese vacuum pump is doing well. Uh, because I don't have scales, I today decided to use the actual 
cans to fill the system just to get as, as accurate as possible. Um, and yeah, it's charging up now. And it's starting to get nice and cold. So this is the car fully charged now. Note, I still don't have a shroud on the radiator. That is something I still need to obtain. But things are looking good. I still have to repair that wiring. Um, I might do that tomorrow. So it's 32 degrees today, it's quite warm. And the coldest I got from these scent vents was around 5 degrees Celsius. Which is more than acceptable. I've got to replace this terrible, terrible cluster. The trip meter does not even work. And it's constantly making clicking noises, so there's something not right with it. And it looks like garbage anyway. But I need to get the car licensed with this because it has the correct odometer reading. And then I will fit the other one. I have a temporary movement pass for today, so I am legally test driving this vehicle. The steering is not adjusted properly, so the wheel does not sit straight. But my air conditioning is magnificent. It's nice and cold. Um, I forgot to plug in the vacuum hose into the uh, left headlight after having it removed for the air conditioning work. So I'll have to plug that back in once I get home. And no doubt I forgot to plug in the actual headlight as well, so I probably don't even have working indicators on the left. But in any case, um, I'm damn pleased with today's efforts and it's very comfortable driving this car now. So after the test drive, I did reconnect everything that I forgot about, the vacuum line and the headlight connection. And the axle shafts have proven themselves now, so I can go ahead and stake those nuts on those axle shafts. So all in all, a productive and successful day.